Help me, brother. I cried as I stumbled into his home on a freezing winter night. My clothes were torn and ragged and barely kept me warm. I stumbled into my brother's house in the middle of a freezing winter night, holding a baby in my arms. Help me, brother. I cried. He was speechless at the sight of me, so changed and frail, dressed only in a tattered shirt and barefoot. What on earth happened? He asked quickly, ushering me into the house and warming the room. The baby wrapped in my jacket was fast asleep, but I couldn't stop shivering. Who did this to my precious baby sister? My brother murmured through clenched teeth. As I heard my brother's soothing voice, I felt a wave of relief wash over me, as if all my strength had been drained from my body. My name is Sarah, a 27-year-old housewife with a young son. I used to be a nurse until Jack, the son of the hospital director, proposed to me. Jack was kind and efficient in his work, which initially attracted me to him. I have a brother five years older than me. After our parents were tragically killed in a car accident when I was four, and he was in third grade, he became my protector. Our parents died when their car was hit head-on by a truck whose driver had fallen asleep at the wheel, and my mother, a nurse, was working late, and it happened when my father went to pick her up. Before he left to pick her up, my father had casually said to my brother, John, I'm counting on you to take care of Sarah. Those words were unforgettable to my brother, who took them to heart and has protected me ever since. He has always been like a superhero to me. After the accident, it seemed that my brother and I would be sent to separate foster homes. However, our paternal grandparents, with whom we hadn't had much contact, took us in. When I first met our grandfather, with his white hair and bushy beard, he looked like a storybook Santa Claus. He murmured, You're the spitting image of your father, and I think I saw tears in his eyes. Our grandmother was a kind woman who hugged me tightly and cried, Poor child. Later I learned that our father had fallen out with our grandfather and left home, which was tantamount to running away. Our grandfather wanted him to continue the family business, but our father wanted his freedom. Neither would give in, and they eventually parted on bad terms. John and I moved to our grandparents' house in the rural mountains. Our grandfather, a renowned potter, created work so famous that a single teacup could sell for thousands of dollars. As a result, John and I grew up without financial hardship. Our grandfather was stubborn, hated dishonesty, and was totally dedicated to his work, while our grandmother was incredibly kind. Although our parents were no longer with us under the watchful eyes of our grandparents, we grew up happy. John attended a prestigious university in the city, and I went to nursing school. We both had the opportunity to follow our dreams. But when our grandmother's health deteriorated, John returned home from the city. I wanted to return home as well, but since I was still a student, John discouraged me. John had always been interested in our grandfather's work, but was told to follow his own path, which led him to the university. Our grandfather regretted forcing our late father to continue the family business and didn't want his grandchildren to go through the same ordeal. However, Jayan insisted on being taught pottery by our grandfather. He had always been handy, which made pottery a good fit for him. In addition, John excelled in everything from academics to sports and was well-liked by his friends. He was truly a superhero, taking care of our ailing grandmother while mastering the art of pottery as Jayan learned the trade from our grandfather. I graduated from nursing school and started working as a nurse. That's when Jack proposed to me and we got married. We had a beautiful wedding, and what I remember most are the happy smiles of Jayan and our grandfather. John brought pictures of our parents to the wedding. We all want you to be happy, Sarah, including mom and dad, he said, 
shedding tears openly. Our grandmother, who was too ill to attend, cried tears of joy when she saw the video of the ceremony. I felt truly blessed to have a great family. I quit my job as a nurse, moved into my husband Jack's family home, and began supporting him as a full-time homemaker. We had one child and Jack was kind. Our life seemed smooth sailing, and I couldn't have imagined the hellish days that were to come. Not long after my grandmother died, Jack attended the funeral with me and comforted me. My grandfather was so disappointed that I couldn't even talk to him. John, while supporting our grandfather, immersed himself more and more in his pottery. Six months passed. Help me, brother. I cried as I ran to my brother's house in the middle of a freezing winter night, wearing ragged clothes and holding a baby in my arms. Jayan was at a loss for words when he saw my drastically changed appearance. I was so thin and weak, just wearing a thin, tattered shirt and barefoot. What on earth happened? He asked quickly, letting me in and warming the room. The baby wrapped in my coat was fast asleep, but I couldn't stop shivering. Who has done this to my dear sister? John murmured through clenched teeth. I felt a wave of relief wash over me, as if all the strength had left my body. I didn't want to worry John or our grandfather, but I had no choice but to tell them. I began to tell them what had happened at my father-in-law's house. Jack and I had been living together, but because of my in-law's concern that I rest during and after the pregnancy, we moved into their house. My in-laws had both remarried and seemed like a really close family. Jack was my mother-in-law's stepson. I was happy that my child and I could be a part of this family. My father-in-law was kind to me, telling me to make myself at home because I had no father. His kindness was precious to me, but my mother-in-law did not seem to like it. You are flirting with my husband, aren't you a disgusting woman? She began to say that she began to molest me when my father-in-law was not around. You're an illiterate child without parents, she sneered. She not only verbally abused me, but also physically harmed me. She poured boiling water on me, put needles in my food, and even tried to push me down the stairs. It was life-threatening. My mother-in-law's family had a long-standing reputation in the retail business, managing a large chain of department stores run by her brother. Her background is miles away from mine. You can't mix with someone who grew up in poverty, she said. She looked down on me. Then a situation arose that added to my problems because of a shortage of staff at the hospital. A former nurse was often called in to work alongside my husband, Jack. During this time, I noticed something disturbing. Jack, being the son of the hospital director, was often seen giving the nurses unreasonable reprimands. Move faster. You're a paid nurse, right? Don't let up just because my father is lenient. Once I take over this hospital, I won't be so lenient. How many times do I have to tell you to order the supplies in advance? They don't come cheap, you know. Don't take running a hospital lightly, he would scold. Such unreasonable remarks were directed at nurses, who were working hard for the patients. Jack, don't you think that's too harsh? Everyone here is doing their best. I interjected. He didn't take kindly to my standing up to him. He lost his temper in front of the other nurses. Since then, Jack has been distant from me. My mother-in-law might have had something to do with that, because she told Jack from the beginning, you're too soft on your wife. She takes you for granted. Well, my father-in-law was still fine. Jack couldn't be openly hostile or abusive in front of him. But then my father-in-law became seriously ill in bedridden. My mother-in-law seized the opportunity and made me do all the household chores, treating me like a housekeeper. I was very busy carrying my son on my back, cooking, doing laundry and cleaning, even in front of my father-in-law. 
My mother-in-law started to abuse me, but my weak father-in-law could not stop her. Please don't talk to Sarah, he would say. There you go again, defending that woman, and you can't even do anything with your weak body. Oh, how I wish you were gone. She would retort, spitting venom at my sick father-in-law. I endured it. For the sake of my son and my father-in-law. The harassment escalated. Housekeepers don't eat with the family. Later she told me that I was so upset that I lost my appetite when I looked in the mirror. I was shocked to see my thin and ragged reflection. My husband said I only married you because you were a bit attractive, but I never thought you'd become such a shabby woman. I'm too embarrassed to be seen with you. He told me to move from our bedroom to the storage room. How cruel can people be? My husband and mother-in-law even started to verbally abuse my son. Of course he's not smart. Look who his mother is. My mother-in-law would say that his constant crying is annoying. Make him stop right now. My husband would demand. It felt like something inside me had snapped. I had decided to run away. My only concern was my father-in-law. If I didn't take care of him, who would? He would be in trouble. But my father-in-law said, Don't worry about me, Sarah. You should run to your brother. He pulled out several $100 bills from under his pillow and pressed them into my hand. I decided to flee on the spot in the clothes I was wearing. I wrapped my son in my coat to keep him warm, rushed outside, stopped a taxi with the money my father-in-law had given me, and went to my grandfather's house. I told my grandfather and my brother John the whole story at once. John, with an angry expression I had never seen before, shook his clenched fist. He calmed me down and said, You've had a hard time, haven't you? It's okay now, relax. I burst into tears. My grandfather also mumbled. I can't forgive this. A few days later, I left my son with my grandfather and decided to return to my in-law's house with John to get my things. I had left in a hurry without a word, so I thought it would cause trouble if there was any fuss. When we returned to my in-law's house, my husband was muttering with a cold look. You finally came back, huh? John replied calmly. My sister seems very distressed, so we'll take care of her for a while. We came today to collect some of her personal belongings. My husband replied, I married her, so if she doesn't come back, there will be no one to take care of the household. That's a big problem for me, my mother-in-law looked down. John said, I heard that you do pottery. It must be a poor life, isn't it? Even if you take care of my daughter-in-law, it will be hard for you, won't it? Please send her back. It's a problem for us too. John clenched his fists, and I could see that he was desperately trying to control his anger. When we asked to retrieve our belongings, we were directed to a storage room in the corner of the hallway that served as my room. In the corner of the cramped room, cardboard boxes and old appliances were carelessly placed. There were a few changes of clothes for me and my son, no heater, just a thin blanket and a thin mattress. John was at a loss for words when he saw the harsh conditions under which I lived. When he looked at my mother-in-law, he said, Is this where you pushed my dear sister and her child? She replied, She should be grateful to have a room. She's just a housekeeper. I wanted to leave that house as soon as possible, but I was worried about my father-in-law and wanted to see him. When I did, he quietly gave me something and apologized to John for not being able to protect me for several days, after which we made preparations with my grandfather and John. I went to my father-in-law's house determined to fight for my son. I couldn't run away forever. When we arrived, I handed the divorce papers to my husband. He was surprised for a moment but then said he wouldn't pay alimony or child support. Since I chose to leave, 
I played a recording of his mother belittling me and him yelling at me. This is proof of the abuse I have suffered. I informed them. My husband and mother-in-law looked shocked and asked, When did you record this? It turned out that my father-in-law had secretly recorded everything to help me. He had discreetly given the recording to me when I went to pick up my things a few days before. John, who had graduated from law school and passed the bar exam while helping our grandfather with his pottery work, said, You can get a divorce because your husband is at fault. John had been actively practicing law to help the needy in our community, and now he promised to fight for me with all his heart. My father-in-law, who is confined to a wheelchair, showed up and handed the divorce papers to my mother-in-law. He had also written down all the verbal abuse he had endured and was now ready to divorce as well. He would rather live in a nursing home than live with my mother-in-law. When my mother-in-law heard this, she burst out laughing. Go ahead and divorce me. I'll go back to my brother's house and return to my luxurious life, she said. That's when my grandfather made a phone call and said, I'll cancel all contracts with a family like that. As it turned out, the big department store run by my mother-in-law's brother was on the verge of bankruptcy. He had been eagerly trying to close a deal to exhibit and sell my famous grandfather's pottery and was about to close it. A call came from her brother, the owner of the department store, who was cutting all ties. My mother-in-law blanched, muttered, that's impossible, and sank to her knees. She finally seemed to understand her situation and began to beg, please forgive me. I was out of line. I have nowhere else to go. Please let me stay here. Sarah, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. There was no way we could forgive her now. We all stared coldly at my crying mother-in-law. However, there was one person who still didn't seem to fully understand the situation. It was my husband who said to me, I'm going to inherit this hospital. If you want a divorce, I'll pay alimony and child support. I'll marry someone younger and prettier than you. But then my father, my father-in-law, said one sentence. The hospital has been sold. My husband's eyes widened in shock. It was Jack who was pulling the strings at my father-in-law's request. Get out of here right now. My father-in-law yelled at his stepson. My husband's face turned white. He was not legally adopted by my father-in-law, who was actually his stepfather, so he had no legal claim to his stepfather's assets. On the contrary, I was legally adopted by my father-in-law, who had taken good care of me. Sensing the tide of events, my husband quickly changed his tune and pleaded for a fresh start with me. I coldly rejected him. After that, my son and I went on to enjoy life at my grandparents' house. He cried less and spent his time playing in nature, finding flowers and insects. My in-laws divorced, and the tape proved crucial in establishing my mother-in-law's guilt. According to mutual acquaintances, my mother-in-law and her husband now live in a small rented apartment. Their attempts to find new jobs have not gone well, and they seem to be getting by on part-time work. Their days are filled with endless arguments, each blaming the other for their current situation. My grandfather is living comfortably in a high-end retirement home, and my son and I visit him often. John continues to work on the pottery, as usual. Under my grandfather's guidance, my mother-in-law's brother, who wasn't at fault, had the pottery exhibition at his department store. At the exhibition, my brother met a lovely woman who was a fan of pottery, and they started dating. I expect we'll hear good news from him soon. I work as a nurse at a hospital near my grandfather's house. It was my dream to become a nurse like my mother, and now I find fulfillment in caring for my patients.